process uh, with our business group and the candidates for the Democratic nomination for the president of the Board of Elections. Tell us about yourself. Uh, well, we produce uh, members of the editorial board and also uh, other editors and reporters on our staff. Okay. You mentioned the show. You've been on a lot of events. We'll start with the obvious one. Um, why do you think you're the best person that the Democratic Party could nominate to run for the presidential election? Well, I'm running because I think I have a great record. But Washington, D.C. is a great city. They tell us in big ways that we can do it. It's a place of pride and corporation. And uh, the, jo the job of the president is to be the return of government at a bottom for the people. And for the last 10 years, I've been organizing folks uh, in their efforts to get them to vote for the next president. Okay. So it's not about the individual, it's about the government. I think that this year is about the government, but it's also about the president and his efforts in starting a new demographic that is going to register as the most active uh, caucus of thousands of voters voters in across the world. And I think that we're in our 18th week of the cycle. Okay. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, you talked about the uh, process of creating a candidate to run for the presidency first and foremost in the race. Uh, I agree with you that candidates for presidential office person about addressing our climate crisis as the Democratic contender. I said I'd make it my first priority, that I would declare a state of emergency, that I would work on it um, from an environmental justice standpoint, and I would make it the lead focus of my foreign policy. I also have over a decade of history of working successfully for clean energy and to, m to control the climate crisis in the ways that I don't think anybody else in this race can approach. And I think that if you believe, which I also believe, that we absolutely have to deal with it on a real-time basis, and that not only do we have to, but that we can, and not only can we, but we can do it in a way that will make Americans richer, better, better employed, better paid, and healthier, then I, I think it's something where I'm in a completely different position in terms of where I prioritize this and how, how urgent I think it is. And lastly, a lot of elections come down to the economy. You know, I think it was Bill Clinton's campaign that said in 1992, it's the economy, stupid. Well, when it comes to the economy, I spent 30 years building a business from scratch. I've traveled all over the world understanding what makes companies profitable, what makes countries prof prosperous, and how those countries choose to share that and what works in the long run. So if Mr. Trump is still in office, that's in my mind a good day. And if he, he's going, if he is, he's going to run on the economy because he, and I think I'm the person to take him down on because I have much greater experience in terms of understanding how e uh, economics works. I have much greater experience in terms of evaluating what works and doesn't work because I've looked at it all over the world and I've seen what works and doesn't work. And so I think consider him to have been, you know, as I've said on TV, a fraud and a failure in business. He's a fraud and a failure in terms of being a steward of the American economy. He, d you know, I think of him as being deeply incompetent when it comes to economics. And I think that that's something I have no qualms about saying and I have no qualms about proving. So, and I think in a way that if you listen to these debates, there have been almost no conversations about prosperity. There have been almost no conversations. I've been on one debate, which was the last debate. I brought up climate three, two or three times. I think one other person mentioned it in passing one time. So I think I'm a very different candidate. I'm an outsider. Everybody else is an insider. I have experience in economics that I think really is completely different from everybody else's. And I have a climate history that I also think is completely different from everybody else in this race. 
So your leadership has been in the business sector and in philanthropy. How do you think presidential leadership differs from your previous leadership experience? Well, I'm gonna, let me answer that question, Carol, but also let me differ with you politely a little bit. Okay. And that's this. Look, the stuff I've been doing is political, not philanthropy. You know, if you orga we organized the largest youth voter mobilization effort in American history. That's not philanthropy, that's politics. If it were philanthropy, I could write it off on my taxes. <laughs> you know, we did, you know, if we, we've taken on these corporations at the ballot box, that's not, you know, I haven't really done any, uh, when people describe me as a philanthropist, I think, wow, that's not how I picture myself. Actually, what I've done much more is take action politically to, to work as an outsider, but in the political system to try and affect change. Now, I'll, now having made that a polite uh, addendum, <laughs> let me say this. Um, I think there's an executive question about how you run things. And I think that starting organizations and running them, which I've done since I was 28 years old, organizations that start with nothing and end up having thousands of people working for them is something that I think should be relevant in terms of serving in the executive branch of the government. But I think the, the, the other point about the executive branch that's really true in the present is you have to have the broadest possible vision of America. You know, there's one thing about running things, and I do think that there's, that running organizations is somewhat similar, but this is a different organization, but I think more than that, you have to have the broadest possible vision of what you're trying to get done, and I think you have to have the deepest possible relationship with the people of this country. And I think that that's something that is, you know, completely different from my mind. I've been traveling around this country full time for over seven years. I've been organizing coalitions of Americans for over 10. But I think there's a complete difference between sitting in an office and reading numbers and talking to somebody whose life has been changed by a policy or a decision and understanding how deep that is and understanding that some of these policies are cruel, that their impacts on human beings are profound, disturbing, and unfair, and understanding how much is at stake in terms of making sure you keep that point in that there are hundreds of millions of people whose lives are going to be profoundly affected by your caring about them, understanding what they're going through, and making sure you never forget them. So in concrete terms, tell us how the country will be different four years into a Tom Steyer presidency. You know, to me, it's just a completely different vision of what this country is about. It, it, in, uh, honestly, completely different. First of all, I really believe that every American is equal and that this government should is going to succeed to the extent that the American people succeed, all 300 plus million of us. And that implies that we are going to, in fact, invest in the American people, and that's going to be our success, that we are going to make sure that kids get an education so that they can reach their capabilities. We are, that is going to be our priority, that in fact, I'm going to look at American success, America's success as the success of Americans. And I think that that's been something that has been deeply lacking. I think that we're going to deal with the real problems, and they're going to be, you know, look, we have a broken government. We have people who are suffering completely unnecessarily and really in a way that I find pretty upset. And so, you know, when we talk, it's one thing to talk about health care. It's another thing to talk to somebody who says, if they get rid of, Ob of, the event, the, of Obamacare, I'm going to die. That's not a trivial point. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to talk about a 40-year war on working people. It's another thing to talk about people working in the mental health uh, area in Iowa and hear how they're not getting raises, how they're not getting overtime really how their lives are being profoundly stunted by you know, what I consider to be absolutely short-sighted and unfair policies. And so I think that we're going to have a different sense of what we're trying to create. 
We're going to go back to the idea that we're world leaders morally, technologically, and commercially. And we're going to go back to the idea that American citizens have real rights in the 21st century. And we should start, stop being, look, you know, being divided, stop picking at each other, and start creating something great together, which is what this country was founded to do. I think people are, need a much greater sense of community. And I think that that's something that's got to change. And obviously, this president does everything he can to break that down. You said one of your measuring <coughs> sticks will be the success of Americans. Yeah. Um, the current president says that the economy is great, and he uses as measuring sticks low unemployment rate, performance of the stock market. How would you measure success of the economy? Look, I, I know the unemployment. I know the unemployment uh, rate is low. I know people can't live on their jobs. I know the the stock market is high. I think I know a little more about the stock market than this president. It's high because the bottom lines of corporations are fat and interest rates are low. The question I would ask is, what's happened to 320 million Americans? Wh wh where's the measure in there of how Americans are doing? Where's the measure of how our lives are getting better? You know, wh where's the measure of us being better educated, better paid, uh, healthier, longer lives? That's what I'd like to see. And in fact, those, those statistics aren't good. You know, I think we've, there's been a terrible mistake made in the United States since 1980 that if the economy is growing, that's good for everybody. Turns out it isn't. Turns out that when you really disaggregate that all the money was going to big corporations and rich people and that working people really got stiffed for two generations. So it, there, his statistics don't cover that. Secondly, is he, per, you know, I look at this economy and you ask yourself, not how are we doing this year, that definitely matters. But the question is, how are we doing this year in the context of doing well in a long term in terms of building better lives and more value for Americans? And in that, we're doing terribly. You know, this is a guy who's a really short-term guy. He's a big deficit guy. He's a, every short-term thing he can do, he does all the things that provide long-term <coughs> success and health and happiness for America, he cuts. He's a big education cutter. He's well, a big health care cutter. That's not prosperity in the long run. What are the pra practical things that president can do to turn that around? Look, I think it is really a question about pushing on where you, how much money you take in and where you spend it. And I think that you know, a lot of this has to do with focus and resources. But I think you know, to start with, the, the, the tax plan that he put through, I view as an attack on working Americans, a gigantic attack on working Americans, a huge give, you know, a, practically a straightforward insult, a huge giveaway to the richest and to the biggest corporations. And immediately, if you read, and I don't mean to be rude because I don't know if you, I don't know if you would have looked at this, Richard, but there was a thing when they when the tr the deficit came out. What's this today, Friday? I think it was this week. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> the deficit came out this week. And Steve Mnuchin said, well, the problem with, the reason we have this huge deficit is because the Democrats won't work with us in cutting social programs. I don't know if you saw that. A and I looked at that and I thought, okay, how many different ways do I find that insulting to every American? Oh, my goodness gracious. I thought that was one of the most arrogant and insulting things I'd ever heard somebody say. And that's exactly what I, how would I change it? They blew up the deficit to give away the, the money in taxes to rich people and big corporations. And then they blame Democrats for not cutting the social programs that they want to cut to support the long-term success of Americans. That to me is so upside down intellectually and morally, it's hard for me to describe. You know, I look at that and see, I see a Department of Education that's opposed to Americans getting <laughs> educated. I see people who try and cut every, every program that I think builds long-term wealth in terms of research and education and helping Americans reach their capability. I find what they're doing in, in terms of trade policy, this trade war, which specifically hits islands, specifically whacks farmers, is a dumb, dumb, dumb idea. I would end it on day one. But there is a misunderstanding in, term, in, in these guys' minds about what we're trying to create. They're literally 
easing the rules on pollution to try and prop up failing industries as opposed to building the industries of the future and getting Americans employed in them and trying to take care of American workers. I look at them, it's like everything they do in my mind has a, an outlook of, you know, he, I think this guy's outlook is far, far too short and he does nothing to build the long-term strength of America and Americans. And just in the, in the normal sense of the world, in the 21st century, how could that be smart? You know, I look and say, and I'm not kidding, this is really a guy who's bankrupted a bunch of casinos. And he has a plan. You borrow a ton of money, you overpromise what you're going to deliver, then you don't deliver anything like it, and then you go bankrupt. And we're three-fourths of the way there. I mean, if you, there was an article in yesterday's Wall Street Journal saying, the Wall Street Journal, his tax plan overpromises and underdelivers. I mean, did he really think that what he was saying was true? I have no idea, but it wasn't true. He was promising a huge reinvestment boom. No. He was promising it would be shared with American workers. No. That was a straight up giveaway. And anybody w who knew anything about economics could have seen it at the time. That every single word that he and Steve Mnuchin and, and corporate America was saying about how this was a huge boon for working people, absolute, it's either dishonesty or stupidity. Take your choice. You've talked about. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's upsetting. <laughs> Because that's a huge, you know, you knew the next step was going to be, we can't afford to send you to school. You knew the next step was, we can't afford, you can't afford to have a doctor. You knew that every single step after that was going to be coming out of the hides of working people. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, there it is. When you talked about what you do with the tax plan, you talked about a wealth tax. Mm -hmm. um, you've also talked about expanding the earned income tax credit on the other end of the scale. Yeah. How far would you go with that? And, and do you have a plan specifically for all the people in the middle? Look, I do. In, in my opinion, what we really need to do is undo the tax breaks for corporations and rich people, increase the earned income tax credit, and increase all of the programs supporting people in the middle. Look, it, when I look at what's going on with people in the middle, there are two things that have been going on for 40 years. No raises and exploding costs. You know, if you look at the cost of health care, it's, it's gone from literally like 5 to 7% of the economy to 20% since 1970. It, it, you know, it increases, it inflates at substantially more than the inflation rate every single year. So it's just great, it, you know, and compounding just eats you up over that period of time, and it's eating up Americans. So to, in my mind, Amer we need to divvy up the money differently. And so to me, the question about if you look about who's getting the money, it's it really, it's shocking. Since, since Ronald Reagan got elected president, all of the money's been going to the richest people in corporations. Really, that has to change. I mean, the, it's incredible to see the successful attack on working people politically and then the economic results. It's, it's actually painful to look at and when you, I'm saying, don't just look at the statistics. The statistics say basically people haven't had a real raise for 40 years, two generations. But then go talk to Americans and see what it means to them. See, see, see really how pinched people are between the cost of healthcare, the cost of rent, and the cost of education. There, it's really a gigantic switch. So the question is, how do you really go after that, go after that both in terms of the costs that are eating them up and in terms of their share of the income that they're getting? Because it's way too low. You know, if you, I, I think, I said this in the debate, but if you just inflation adjust the minimum wage, and I know that's not a living wage, but the minimum wage as an example of where the country is, from 1970 or 1980, you get to 11 bucks, it's seven and a quarter. That would be just no raise. Just the same buying power as 1970 and 1980. If you put in the productivity gains of American workers, which are dramatic, it would be 22 bucks. The minimum wage. Just holding it constant from 40 or 50 years ago. That's what's happened to Americans. It, it's really savage. And when you see it in person, 
when you go out and talk to people and understand what it means for their lives. It's not fair. It's not fair. This doesn't have to be. We are much richer than that as a country. This is, this is really unjust. And so to me, the question is, how do we, that is the biggest thing we need to change for middle class people is they need to be making a lot more money in real terms and we need to be going after these health costs in a gigantic way. Look, we pay twice as much as other countries for health. I'm sitting here saying corporations own this government. We pay 10 times as much for insulin as Canada. Literally, that's a drug that was invented in 1930. There's, I mean, there's no excuse for that. So a lot of people say that the public option versus Medicare for all argument kind of misses the point that it really is the cost of health care. Yes. Um, that so much, m many costs needs to be kind of wrung out of the system. How would you go about that? Look, I've been saying these corporations own the government. I mean, if you look at the big corporate interests in health care, the big corporate interests are drug companies, insurance companies, and hospitals. The drug companies have had their way. You know, there's so many rules that need, laws that need to be changed. We don't negotiate with drug companies. We are the only country in the world that does not negotiate with drug companies. As a result, we pay much, much more for drugs than other advanced countries that are very well to do. That makes no sense. Secondly, it, the, I, to me, this is the point. I, I think, Carol, you, you're making a good point. We have a health care cost crisis, and it's hitting almost every single person in the United States. And because we have a health care cost crisis, we have a health care availability crisis. Because we can't afford it, because it's just so darn expensive that then it gets rationed. What we really, and we need to attack the cost. There is a huge, you know, the, the thing about the public option as opposed to Medicare for all is it also gets rid of the income line and the profit margin for insurance companies, the overhead for insurance companies and the profit line. It just allows people to make the choice as opposed to insisting that everybody get into one system. And we need to get, you know, look, there's gigantic fraud in this system. Look, the, the U.S. government has the opportunity to drop costs across the board in healthcare, and I would say a responsibility to, to the American people. But if you think there's not going to be pushback, <laughs> there's, I'm saying, we have a broken government. This is an absolutely perfect example where we are paying twice as much as other countries for the same or worse health care. I mean, it's a trillion and a half bucks a year. They like making it. They're not going to go like, oh, yeah, we have been overcharging you. You can have it back. There's going to be, they don't, they like it. You know, they've promised there's, you know, if you look, I don't know if you guys do this, but on January 2nd, they raised the prices of hundreds of drugs. You know that? Hundreds. You kind of go, did, did the cost of producing those drugs really go up today? No. They want to make more money. Period. And, you know, they have this program in their office that says, this is how much money we need to make, so this is how much we need to raise the price. Somebody's got to be pushing back on behalf of the American people, but we're not. So can you talk a little bit, you talked very passionately about the tax plan that was passed. You talked very passionately about defending the middle class. Can you pause there and say, why are you the right spokesperson to be defending these issues? Because I don't know your personal tax situation, but I imagine the tax plan passed actually benefited you and you're- To have be fair, it didn't. Well, why not? Because it also got rid of deductibility. So okay. in fact, it was really an attack it, what it really was doing was advantaging corporations across the board and rich people in red states. That was, a, if you go look, yeah, and, and I will point out to you what, what I know everyone at this table already knew, that Mr. Trump just moved to Florida. Yeah. But There's a reason. You've obviously done well for yourself. Why are you the best spokesperson to defend the middle class and as you know, many of the, your rivals draw their roots for middle class and say, I am middle, the middle class icon, and I've Look, lived my life as middle class. Why are you the person to So let me say, these? let me tell you a little about myself, and then let me a little, talk a little bit about uh, why, I'm the, why I can do the best job. Um, 
you know, my mother was a school teacher. She's from Minnesota. My grandfather was a professor at the University of Minnesota. My mom was a school teacher in the New York public schools in the Brooklyn House of Detention. My father was the son of a plumber who graduated from law school, went into the Navy and stopped being a lawyer, went into the Navy, went back to being a lawyer. Were they two hardworking people who had done well? Yes. Was I really lucky? Yes. Was I rich? No. I, mean, I literally did not inherit a penny. So when I think about myself, do I think of myself as being ridiculously lucky? I do. But why do I think that? Because I had a family that really took care of me and I was very secure and loved and provided for. I got a great education. There, I, but it isn't like I inherited $413 million. I inherited, I didn't inherit $413, period. So why am I the right person? Look, as an outsider, I'm the person who's been taking on these corporations. Really. If the, if the fight, to me, this is a fight. There's a reason we pay this much for healthcare. It's because the corporations are writing the rules. Okay. If the, if the point is to break the, the hegemony of corporations, I'm the person who's been doing that for 10 years. If the point is to actually reestablish re democracy, I founded and started one of the biggest grassroots organizations in the United States. People can talk about grassroots, but NextGen did the biggest youth voter mobilization in history. We've registered over a million and a half people. We've knocked on tens of millions of doors. If you're talking about someone who has a history of actually doing this from the outside, it's actually me. And if you, you have to ask yourself, look, I'm talking about term limits. Is anyone else talking about term limits? No. Will anyone even say they're against term limits? No. I'm talking about a national referendum. I actually believe the, the wisdom in America resides with the American people. I actually think that. <laughs> I'm not just saying it. I would have a national referendum because I think Congress has a monopoly on legislation and it's been bottled up and it's failed. You know, I'm talking about actual structural changes that other people won't talk about because it shakes up Washington, D.C. And we ain't getting this done without shaking up Washington, D.C. So I look at this and I'm like, this is going to change with energy from the grassroots. This is, you don't, Honestly, Moscow is not reforming Moscow. London is not re reforming London, and DC is not reforming DC. To build on Rachel's question a bit, though, um, for you being that vehicle for change, um, you also, um, as an investor, invested in private prisons, invested in coal mines. Uh, one could argue that. Um, someone with that kind of background maybe isn't the best messenger for change. Do you regret some of those investments? Yes. Look, I invested, let's go through the two you mentioned, coal mines. Look, I did not realize growing up or in the first part of my investing career that fossil fuels were going to have, create this huge problem. I, uh, over a decade ago, I did realize it. I divested. I took the giving pledge to give away the majority of my assets during my lifetime to good causes, and I've spent over a decade working on climate change. Everybody in this room and everybody in the United States, well, maybe not the youngest people, well, even the youngest people, have grown up in a fossil fuel-driven economy. You know, it's, there's, we have to make a change, and I made that change over a decade ago, and I feel like, do I wish I'd realized it sooner? Sure, but actually, if you look over the last decade, and all these people running, I have by far the strongest record of working on climate. So in fact, I've dedicated <laughs> over a decade of my life to working specifically on that issue because I realized, wow, there's something I didn't know, so I changed. In private prisons, so we bought that, and I realized it was wrong, and I sold it 15 years before. And we brought it up. I was actually way ahead of the curve on that. There was a strong argument at that point that I decided was false, and which is why I sold it that actually private prisons would be more efficient and could do a better job. And I decided that's not true. And so I sold it for moral reasons after owning it for a couple months. So actually I was ahead of the curve on that. Do I wish I was smarter on these things? Sure, sure I do. But actually in both of those I was 
way ahead of, you know, sort of popular opinion. And I did the right thing because I realized I came to the right conclusion on my own. Maybe building off that experience, um, how would you reduce the rate of incarceration in this country and racial disparities? So, so let's talk about that. Look, I work, if you look at how we would cut incarceration in half, and we incarcerate people at seven times the rate of other countries. And it's definitely extremely skewed and unfair on a racial basis. If you look at how to actually do that, the first thing is to get rid of money bail. I personally worked really hard in California and we got rid of cash bail. That's a huge part of the system and it, you, know, you can just see on the face of it, it has to be unfair to think that someone who can afford bail doesn't have to spend their time awaiting trial in prison, in jail, and someone who, who's poorer and can't afford bail has to spend months in, in jail, which means you're not living with your family, you're not earning a salary, uh, and you're much, you have a different relationship to taking a plea. It's completely unfair. That's the number one thing, believe me. The number two thing has to do with mandatory sentences. I've worked in California to get rid of what are called automatic sentence enhancements, where if you have a prior, you automatically get time added to your uh, next sentence. I'm, and I pushed really, we got rid of that. And we pushed on it. Because it's a question of don't we need more judge discretion? And all of these mandatory minimums and automatic sentences and things are very harsh and uh, inhuman and actually lead to people in jail much longer than a judge would ever give them. I think the, t the, three other, the two other things that really count on this, those are the two biggest, by the way, in terms of actual numbers. The two others are clemency. Would you get let people out of jail um, who are in for things that are no longer illegal or who are old and have more than served their time and there's no purpose to having them in jail anymore and decriminalizing drugs. But, but people think that decriminalizing drugs is the biggest, actually the biggest part of this is getting rid of cash bail. That, but if you look at the numbers, I don't know if you have, but the biggest one is getting rid of cash bail. Decriminalizing the possession of drugs is actually, I think, a quarter is the, 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 the number one. So that's, I do all four of those things. You know, to me it's crazy, and to me, there's a justice part of this, and specifically, and you were asking about the criminal justice system and race, it's very deep. It goes from policing to sentencing to how we treat previously incarcerated people. And it goes all across the board, and I would address every single one of them. Talking of justice, um, <laughs> talk to us about your, the criteria you would use in um, choosing federal judges. So as the son of a lawyer, I have a lot of respect for the law and people adjudicating the law. But I would want to make sure, look, I would want to feel as if the judges represented justice itself across the board. And so I would want to make sure that they were people who took the rights of every American very, very seriously. And I would want to make sure that they were respectful and careful about the rights of women. I would want to make sure that they were respectful racially. I would want to make sure that they were respectful of the LGBTQ community. I would want to make sure that they understood that Americans all Americans get full rights and privileges being an American citizen. That would be the number one criteria. I think also I think that I'd want to make sure that they understood some form of economic justice, that they were aware of the impacts, broadly speaking, of their decisions on fairness and people and their ruling really economic justice. Specifically with the Supreme Court, um, are you open to ideas about perhaps increasing the number, taking other steps to yes. try to? Go ahead. I am. Look, we've seen a very deliberate and very successful attempt by Mitch McConnell and the Republican Party to stack the federal judiciary. 
both by preventing President Obama from appointing judges and then pushing as many uh, Trump appointees through as possible. And as a result, I think Mr. Trump has appointed a quarter of the bench. I also think Merrick Garland is a name that I'm not going to forget soon. And so I think that, in fact, what we've seen is an attempt to really control um, the federal judiciary for a generation in a way that represents what, to my mind, is a radical minority view. But even with an increased number of what, how does that just not kind of go with the flow and make it a very politicized, even more system? It is a politicized system. In fact, I think what's gone on is, as I said, a radical right-wing party has managed to, has conspired to try and stack the federal judiciary for a generation. That's it, that's what's, it's, it's sort of like, yeah, that's pretty political if you ask me. And the question is, that's taking advantage of the system and really doing a huge disservice to the American people around it. That's what happened. I mean, it's so funny. I love it. You know, that politicizing the system, how much more political can you get? That something really bad has happened deliberately. So the answer to politicizing the court is to politicize it more? Is that what, is that what you're saying by expanding? I don't think you can politicize it. I, I, I would disagree respectfully with you. I think what's happened is there has been a continued attack on what I think of as the American people and, and the system itself. And the question is, how do you push back against that legally within the system? And, and it's a real question. But I think something is, you know, it's kind of like, it, as, as, as what people say in my family, when did the fight start? When we punched them back. It's like, no, nah, actually it started before that. <laughs> I do want to talk about climate. I mean, I'm mad about this. <laughs> it's some, there, something wrong has happened here. This party has conspired consistently to take advantage of the rules and to take advantage of the American people. And it's consistent and it's very one-sided. And it goes, it, this is a perfect example, but so is gerrymandering, so is voter suppression. It's on and on and on. It's not right, and it, it hasn't really been called out, and it's very one-sided, and I think that there, when history looks back, they're going to be shocked. Given what you've just said, if you become president and there's a Republican Senate, how, how do you work with a Republican Senate? Uh, it seems like you're not giving much quarter as far as um, bipartisanship or reaching across the aisle. Well, let me say that. I thought President Obama spent at least five years of his term doing nothing but trying to reach across the aisle, during which time he made zero compromises. And I looked at some of the things he offered and I thought they were extraordinarily generous. And I think that, in fact, the sitting here and putting this on Democrats, I find amusing. It's like, no, if you look at this, something has gone on here that is very one-sided extremely one-sided. And so my opinion in this thing is, as a grassroots person, who do I actually trust in this? The American people. My question is, how do we get the American people's voice into this much more? I mean, it, it, that's my point about, that was my point about impeachment. My point wasn't to go to DC and argue that this guy was a crook and a criminal. My point was, get the American people's voice into it, because if we decide we want something, we get it. But we have to decide. And that's going to be my point on this, too. I think something's gone wrong that's very, very bad for the American people. And so my answer is going to be to go to the American people, because that's who I actually trust. You were ahead of most of the party leaders on impeachment. Um, <laughs> now, now that the rules have been adopted and an inquiry is underway, um, do you think Speaker Pelosi and Majority Leader Schumer are doing everything they should do, or do you still have problems with how this is unfolding? <coughs> this is how I thought it should unfold. I've been pushing for this for over two years, and I've always been pushing for the American people to be brought into it. I've always said, public hearings on TV, let, let us see, let us judge. That's what's going to rule here. 
people still think this is going to get rolled inside of D.C. In my mind, this is the decision here is the American people. And, and I think that's not a partisan question. That's a patriotic question. It, this seems to me to be very much in line with what I just said to you guys. There's something that has gone on here that's wrong. And only the American people are going to set it right. And I think, you know, we got people to sign our petition because that's what we believe in. And that's what I believe in, is that the American people's voice is the one I want to hear and the one I want to make sure is listened to. Could in you talk everyone who's a little bit more about the American people? I mean, one of the things that you have done with your financial success is try to change American opinion and bring them along and give them the tools to express the things that you think should be expressed, like need to impeach, like the work on climate change, and even with young people, like money made a difference in all of those fights that you have fought. So how much is it relying on the American people and how much is it is bringing the American people to where you want them? I don't think, well, let me say this. I think what mattered was organization, and sometimes organization takes money. You know, in my mind, if you look at those things, it wasn't like I spent, mo spent money on anything. I spent money on organization of actual grassroots getting out and talking to people. And so that, and that's been my goal all along. You so, also spent a lot of money on TV. That's not organization, that's, that's opinion change. But that's trying to, look, it, when I think about all those things, what I was talking about was something where I felt there was a clear a clear problem that needed to be addressed, and I felt like the the, pro the people who could solve it were America. Where it was uh, the body politic, the hundreds of millions of Americans, as opposed to the 435 Congress people and 100 senators, because that's what I actually believe in. So in every one of those, what I was really trying to do was bring in the American people's voice, and you know, in climate was part of that an educational thing, sure, because you know something. I didn't know it. I figured I had to figure it out, and I figured I was spending more time thinking about those things than other people. I wanted to give the people the information that I got so that they could come to the same conclusion I did. For their sake. Same thing with, you know, I don't think everybody read the, whatever it was, 448 page Mueller report. Why should that? I did. Because I felt like, I, you know, let me tell you what's in here. In every one of these instances, I thought there was something absolutely in the American people's interest and tried to bring information to them and get in a conversation with them so that they could raise their voice. That honestly, so it's a kind of a two-step process. I agree with that. But in every case, I was trusting them to come to the right conclusion, and I still am. Look, that's why I want televised hearings, because I believe whether you're a Trump supporter or a Trump opponent, when you see what he's done, everybody will go, I didn't know that. You know, I think people like the people sitting at this table who are on the Des Moines Register editorial board know spend a lot of time thinking about politics. And I think there's a common assumption that other people do too. And they don't. And so what I mean it because I and I do this myself. I feel like I'm not so smart. If I know it, everybody must know it. Well, they don't spend their time reading the same things I read and watching the same things I watch. And in every one of these things, I feel like, look, if we could get that information in front of people, with, tr with in terms of this impeachment, they're going to say, I didn't know it. He's a liar and a cheat. If I did that, I'd be in jail. That's what they say. And that's what my research says. And so to me, the question here is, I, if you look at how, I came to the conclusion that that's the only thing that really changes America profoundly. And it's the only thing that should change it profoundly, is American, us together as a people deciding on something. That's the only thing that really changes. And so that's what I, I believe in. You know, if you look at what's going on, we do not, uh, in this election, how is it possible that Donald Trump got elected? How is that possible? It's possible because Americans didn't understand what we were doing that we don't have kind of a framework for thinking about what it means to be an American in the 21st century, what we're trying to accomplish together, what our deepest values are, who we are. That's the, that vacuum is what made the election of Donald Trump possible. 
that's the real issue in front of Americans today. How do you account for that 40% of the public who thinks Trump can absolutely do no, no wrong? Uh, Look, I, I, I don't think, I think that they're saying something that I'm saying, which is this system is broken. It doesn't care about me. It doesn't respect me. It is, you know, it's the swamp. And so I'm going to vote for someone who's going to break it. And I think that I'm sitting here saying, look, this government's been bought. It doesn't work for the American people. We're going to have to break that corporate stranglehold to get back to government of by and for the people. And in a sense, that's what they were saying. I don't think they were wrong. I thought they came up with the wrong answer. But I thought they had real, decent, correct worries about themselves and their families. I believe they came up with the absolute wrong solution, but I believe that they were dealing with the reality of their lives. And they believed somebody that he was gonna do things and it turned out he did the exact opposite of what he promised. And he's a, you know, he, I was saying I thought it was like the Trump Taj Mahal, the bankrupt casinos he, he had. He promised something and he didn't do it. He did the opposite. And he made out like a bandit along the way. I don't see it as any different. Is that people believed him when he, they said he was going to create the Taj Mahal, and people believed him when he said he was going to drain the swamp. Wasn't telling the truth either time. But that didn't mean they were wrong in their analysis. I have respect for them for what they were trying to do. With your re national referendum idea, you're, you're, you're saying I trust the American people to make these decisions, although you just said they made a wrong decision <laughs> with President Trump. Some people would call, have said that this is sort of like the Californianization of politics. Uh, and, and some of us here in the Midwest look at California and all the referendums and sort of it has passed, and, and some of them kind of erratic and zigzagging, and think that maybe that's not the best way to go about politics. Well, I'll say this. California was broken. I don't know if you guys remember reading those headlines, but I bet you do. We were bankrupt. We were paying in script. We literally couldn't pay our bills. We were closing shelters for battered women. Literally, I mean, it was, if you'll excuse my saying, it was a little like closing mental health facilities in Iowa. We were in a desperate place. How did we actually get back to being solvent? Partly the economy came back. We passed a series of revenue raising measures at the ballot box that could never have gotten through the legislature. That in fact, the people love, and, and there are too many referendums and propositions, Carol. I completely agree with you. And there should be a limit on, you know, I, there should be some way to make sure that it's very rare, you know, that it's very limited so people can focus on the one. But in fact, I think that a big part of why California actually is back to being a, a functioning democracy with all the problems that every functioning democracy and imperfections that every functioning democracy has has a lot to do with greater democracy and direct democracy. Both. You know, we registered. NextGen registered over 800,000 people in California. We have a different participation rate. We have pushed really hard within California to get a broader democracy and to get direct democracy. Was it perfect? No. But it is functioning. And it wasn't. And I think a big, you know, the, the, a big part of why it's functioning and why we're solvent, which we weren't, has to do with uh, props. Another election reform. By the way, 26 states have propositions and referenda. It's not like it's just the kooks out in California. <laughs> 20, over half the states have them. But not Iowa. I know. <laughs> I, I, but I would say, listen, if I were in Iowa, I'd be pushing for referenda. There's some stuff here that I think is, I would be want the people to be able to vote on. Well, another reform that uh, you've talked about is doing away with the electoral college. Um, I haven't talked about that as part of my thing. I'm for it. Okay. I just think there's only, you know, you gotta prioritize things. Why would a presidential candidate ever visit Iowa or the rest of flyover country if you abolish the electoral college? 
because you're the first caucus state. Iowa is a swing state in the sense that it went for Obama, it went for Trump, it can go either way. But even more so, the reason that Iowa is such a sophisticated, important state politically is where you come in the lineup of caucuses and primaries. And Which that's isn't a guarantee. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying, you know, it's completely different from other states. I mean, I mean you Okay, pick Wyoming. Why, why would a presidential candidate ever visit there? <laughs> well, let me ask you a question. There are 400,000 people in Wyoming. Are they more important than the 400,000 people who live in San Mateo, California? I think there's a reason the Founding Fathers built in that tension between a but, Senate and the House of asking, Representatives. You're asking me a question. Is there a reason that a, 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 uh, somebody in Wyoming is 100 times more important? than someone in California. No one ever comes to California, just by the way. I mean, I always joke about it. When I go to Drake University and see who's speaking at Drake University, it's amazing. Let's go to UCLA and see who's speaking at UCLA. Yeah, but they don't speak at UCLA, but all the Democrats go to California to pick up some cash so they can but they spend don't talk here. To the people. <laughs> but they don't talk to people. But Rachel, to be fair, I had that argument with Democrats, which is, you're coming here for money. I will arrange for you to talk to some citizens. And they're like, no. You don't want to talk to people of California? No. Rich people are people. <laughs> <laughs> they are. But it's a skewed it's a skewed set. If you're really trying to understand America, that is not where I'd go. Um, In fact, I think that system actually skews people's views. Sure. You know, who you see is who you relate to. Executive privilege. It's nowhere in the Constitution. Do you believe there is such a thing? And if you do, would you have any parameters? <sighs> Look, I think executive privilege, isn't that something that has been <laughs> defined within the court system? So that not everything in, in, uh, in, in terms of how the laws are interpreted was in the Constitution. A lot of it has been subsequent decisions. So, look, I think there's a, there's a huge push and pull between the executive branch and everybody else as power has accumulated there over you know, at least decades, but probably centuries. Um, would you pledge to never defy a congressional subpoena for documents or testimony? I don't know the answer to that because I don't understand the law well enough. I would comply with the law for sure. And, but do, will I pledge to that? I don't understand the law well enough to answer that. I will say this. My, I, <laughs> my goal in, as president would be my goal for the last decade and take a look. I try and be as transparent as possible. And so look, if you say what you're going to do and then you do it and along the way you show everybody what you're doing, it makes life a lot simpler. And so one of the things that I believe as a country is you should have transparent values that we act on. And so it's really important to say what your values are and what you're going to do about it and then show people what you did and to be consistent. That's really important for people so they know how to treat you, that you can be a trusted partner, that actually your values are the way they're going to go so they can set their life around those rules. So that, let me say in the context of that, that is my goal to be as transparent as possible on the values that I believe in. We've hardly talked, not touched really at all on foreign policy. Um, you've said that you would want to withdraw troops from Afghanistan in your first year. You have done a lot of research, Carol. <laughs> um, so how do you, if you do that, how do you keep places for, from Afghanistan becoming a haven again for terror? Look, I think that when we look at what we're doing abroad, the number one job of the president is the safety and health of the American people. That's our number one job, and protecting our vital interests beyond that is our number two job. And so opposing terrorists who attack, who you know, aim to attack the United States is something that we have to do. And that's got, we've got to take that super seriously everywhere. And that's why I thought the president was wrong in Syria. But I think that what we've seen in Afghanistan with our longest 
running war in American history is that we've gotten into a place where we did end up with nation building. That is why we're in. I mean, the first question when you're talking about military forces, what are you doing there? What's the mission? Is the, you know, is the mission at this point to protect Afghanistan or is the mission to protect the people of the United States? You've got to ask that question and then you've got to ask, how are we going to accomplish it? How long is it going to go on? And what does success look like? And how are we going to achieve success? I think it's pretty clear at this point that we didn't ask those questions sufficiently hard when we went into Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think that that's really a, a function of where we are in Afghanistan and why we did ask. I think that you've got to, if we're going to, first of all, obviously this president has hollowed out the State Department and kind of disregarded the idea of diplomacy. But in, in my mind, to a very large extent, that's a gigantic mistake. I think we've been too willing, we've underestimated the cost, both to our service people, but also in every other way of military uh, force. And we have to be very clear that if we're going to use military force, there's a specific mission behind it that we can accomplish, that we understand, that we can measure, and we can end. And I think in Afghanistan, it's pretty clear that we got part of that right, but not all. You mentioned earlier that Ameri uh, Iowa agriculture manufacturing as well has been particularly hit by the trade war. Yes. Um, how do you, you've, you've said that you would end that. <laughs> um, I would. It's a mistake. Uh, how, how do you s use any pressure to still go after things like China on intellectual property right. to try to get anything from more from directly? This trade war? Look, I spent time in China as, as a business person. I know that they cheat. I'm not sitting here wondering how they cheat. I know exactly how they cheat. I've asked Chinese business people, I've asked Chinese lawyers, what's going on here? And they explain it to me. It's not a secret. They close markets, they change rules, they steal intellectual property. Yeah, how is you know, hurting American farmers gonna help that? It, the question is, how do you go against that? And do you really think they only do that to Americans? The question is, how do you make them pay directly for that to make them stop doing that? And they definitely do it. And I know it and I've seen it. And we definitely should be pushing back. But the other point about China is this, look, we don't want China to fail. We want China to play by the rules. And what we're doing right now is trying to hurt them enough so that they'll stop doing something. And we're, we're really hurting Americans. This is a dumb idea. There are, we should go after them with our allies as they cheat, which they do consistently on a large scale, directly. We should say, you're doing this and here's our remedy. Not, you're doing this, so we're gonna punch you. It's like, no, you're doing this and we're, you're closing this market, we're gonna expose that. I, it's very clear they're doing it. We shouldn't be shy about it, they're doing it. And then we should go through the World Trade Organization, we should negotiate on this, we should punish them economically, directly for what they do. They close markets to us. I was over there in like, gosh, 10 or 15 years ago when eBay was just, when uh, PayPal was just being invented, and, you, and this guy was telling me we have this new thing that you can do payments on the internet in a secured fashion. And I was like, that sounds like PayPal. Why don't you just use PayPal? And I'm like, oh, they can't get a license there. I'm like, why not? And the guy just laughed, like, oh, we're never gonna get them a license, are you kidding me? And that was in industry after industry. Like, okay. That's not okay. You, you can't do that to us. But the answer is not to like raise, raise tariffs on farm goods. That's crazy, that is good. that's not the point. The point is you can't do that to us. You've also called China um, the greatest geopolitical threat that the U.S. faces. Um, how else that's would you approach China? Look, I think, I always describe China, and I'm surprised I use those words. I always describe them as a friend. We have a huge relationship with China. We have a huge economic relationship with China. We need them if we're gonna solve climate. They're the biggest source of carbon pollution in the world by far. They're planning on building 
hundreds of coal plants around the world. We are not solving the climate crisis without China. So let me make this point. No one is going to suffer more from the climate crisis than the Chinese. It, it, it really, if you go and look what people in the world are going to suffer the most, oh my gosh. It, it's, 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 if, if you look at Asia, the numbers are amazing. They have to want to solve that crisis. They are the, the way that Paris Accord happened was it started with the U.S. and China working together. The, our ability to work with, look, they do not, they, they have an interest in solving that too. They have an interest in growing economically. We're tied to them. We can't let them cheat, but we're not trying to destroy them. And I think, and we, but it's to, to think that we only have a bilateral relationship, I think is really misleading, inaccurate, and destructive. They have a relationship with everybody else in the world. We should be working with our traditional allies and coalition. The idea that we have to do everything on a bilateral, confrontational, competitive basis, so-called America first, is one of the worst, stupidest ideas ever. And that it has to do with climate, but it has to do with how we deal with China cheating. It has to do with Afghanistan. It has to do with every single thing. Why do we think we have no allies? Why do we treat people as if we're not trustworthy and value-driven? Why do we think that we have to run the world by ourselves without it resorting to our traditional you know, coalition partners? That makes no sense. It's a huge, big, fat failure. Any other questions? I know we're nearly out of time, but I wanted, particularly for the people watching live, you to be able to answer the questions that you've heard from, other, from Democrats who are some of whom are running against you, that you're buying this election, that you are creating grassroots to support you, that the reason you're on the debate stage is because you have the money to spend on You've heard all these arguments. How do you react to them? I'd say two things. One is the only thing that really matters in this election is do you have something to say? I got in, I got, I think I'm the last person to get in this race because I thought someone was, no one was saying what I thought the most important things were to say, that we have a broken government and we got to deal with climate right now. And no one really was saying those things in a way that said, that's the point. Second thing I'd say is this. Look, if you look at my record over the last decade, Rick, you'll see when I think there's a big problem in America, I spend all my time, I mean, people like to talk about it in terms of money, but I spend all my time, I spend all my energy building organizations to try and address that problem. And if that's the worst thing people can say about me, I can take it. You want to make a short closing statement? I would. Look, I'd say this too. I listen to these debates and we sound like a failed society. You know, this crisis, that crisis, this crisis. We are not a failed society. We're the most successful society in the history of the world. We have a failed government. If we take back that government, we are going to end, end it. If we take back the government and stabilize the climate, we are going to be in the best position of any people in the history of the world. The next year, we are actually going to do what Americans always say they're going to do, which is hand on a better world to the next generation. So we have a very straightforward task, and I'm not saying those challenges are nothing. I know we can do them, and if we do them, we will be in the best position of any people in the history of the world. So I am not downhearted and I do I look at us as an incredibly successful society where the people need to take back their government and that's why I'm running for president. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Yes, that's a wrap.